This video is part of a first course in modelling analysis and control and now we're going to focus on an introduction to inverse Laplace transforms. Some core skills then. Can you recognise the underlying time domain signal from a given Laplace transform? Do you know Laplace of common signals and how do we solve ODEs with Laplace? Now Laplace is a tool to support analysis of system behaviours. The focus here is on familiarity with the tool and how to use it. If you want more rigour, please see your mathematics module. Asymptotic values then. Sometimes we're only interested in the asymptotic value of the underlying time domain signal and this can be extracted very efficiently using the final value theorem. So, Let's just make sure we understand what we mean by asymptotic values. So what are the asymptotic values of the following signals? You can see the signals are all listed down here in the legend. So if we look at sine and cosine, so for example, this dark blue one is the, is the sine. What can you tell me about convergence? Well, it never converges and neither obviously does the cosine. So there is no asymptotic value. So don't try to find one. What about terms with a convergent exponential? So you can see here we've got the green curve, exponential, we've got this pink curve, and we've got this black curve. So they've all got convergent exponentials, exponentials with negative signs. And what you notice if you look at them all is they're all converging to zero. What about terms with a divergent exponential? Now we've only got one of those, that's this um, dotted green one, and you can see clearly, that's this one here, it's going off to infinity. It does not converge, it does not have an asymptotic value, so as with sine and cosine, don't try to find one. What about polynomials? We've just got one of those here, t over 8, but you could have t squared and t cubed and so on, and obviously they also diverge. There is no asymptotic value don't try to find one. Now, a key conclusion, only one signal has a non-zero asymptotic value. That's this one here, the constant. So that's the only signal which has a non-zero asymptotic value. The others either diverge or go to zero. So the final value theorem, and you'll see the key point here is you can only use this if the limit exists. Don't use it on a signal which is divergent because you will just get rubbish. So the formula says the limit as t goes to infinity of f of t is the same as the limit as s goes to zero of s times f of s. We can demonstrate this formula works with some simple examples. Here I've got an exponential, e to the minus a t, and it's Laplace transform 1 over s per se. So if I do the limit as s goes to zero of s times 1 over s plus a, you'll see essentially that gives me 0 over a, which is 0. So the asymptotic value is 0, and I know that because if I sketch this e to the minus a t, that's what I expected. What about this one, e to the minus a t cos omega t? So if I do the limit as s goes to 0 of s times s plus a over s plus a squared plus omega squared, I'm going to get 0 over a squared plus omega squared, which is 0. And again, that's the answer I expect. So just some simple examples. Give yourself confidence. Yes, this final value theorem is working. Final example. You can see I've got a slightly more involved transform here, s plus 4 over s, s plus 2. So if I do the limit as s goes to 0 of s, into s plus 4 over s, s plus 2. Now the key thing here is these two s's are going to cancel. So I'm going to get left with 4 over 2, which is 2, and look at the original signal, 2 minus e to the minus 2t, it's giving you the result you expect. The asymptotic value is 2. And a reminder, you must first check the signal is convergent before using the final value theorem. Some, some other examples. Use the final value theorem to find the final value for the underlying signal. So you remember the final value theorem is the limit as s goes to 0 of s g of s. Essentially, you're multiplying by this s. So I can see for this one, by inspection, 
I'm going to get zero because if I set all the s's to zero, let's set all the s's to zero, and then multiply by zero, which is an s, I've got zero over 32. This one here is divergent. You may not know that straight away, but you will very shortly, so don't even try. And this final one, I'm going to multiply by s, because that's the first part of the final value theorem, and then set all the s's to zero, so that s goes, that s goes, that s goes, that s goes, and then you'll notice critically the s on the top cancels with the s underneath, and you're going to get left with 6 over 40. Inverse Laplace using partial fractions. Now, a Laplace transform is made up of components from individual signals. Inverse Laplace is the process of finding these individual components. So here's an example. If you had 4 over s times s plus 2, you can break that into two components, a 2 over s and a 1 over s plus 2. Now, here's a much nastier one. I'm not proposing you will get this in the first course, but you can see I can break this into three separate components, for which you know the Laplace transforms, those are transforms of known signals. So the first thing you need to do is make sure you're familiar with your table of Laplace transforms. You've got this term, this term, this term. So make sure you're familiar with all these transform terms, because this is what you're looking for, because once you've identified one of those forms, you can straight away go and say, well, I now know the underlying time domain signal. Any signals not on this list are unlikely to come up in a first course. So characterising common signals. Signals are characterised by the denominators. That's really key that you get that. So the denominators are what matter most. So first you must factorise the denominator of any signal. If you've got real roots, um, that's one thing, and if you've got complex roots, then you need quadratic factors. So real roots correspond to things like this. Constant, a over s, that's got a real root at zero. Exponential, one over s plus a, that's got a real root at minus a. What if you've got complex roots? Well, that corresponds to things like sine. You can see s squared plus omega squared. So if you're not sure, the roots of this are plus or minus j omega. Or e to the minus a t cos omega t, where the roots are minus a plus or minus j omega, and obviously there's a few others I've not included here due to space. So in this course, we're not going to discuss repeated roots, but you might do that in your mathematics module. So partial fractions with only real roots. It's assumed that students have studied partial fractions in their mathematics prior to a first course in control. And so you need to be competent in doing partial fractions. This is a skill we will just assume. So here's an example. If you had 4 over s squared plus 3s plus 2, you should be confident that the partial fraction expansion is a over s plus 1 plus b over s plus 2, and now your job is to find the residues a and b. And you'll notice implicitly I factorised the denominator to extract the factors s plus 1 and s plus 2. What about this one? 4s plus 1 over s squared plus 4s. You should be confident that the partial fraction function has a over s plus b over s plus 4. And now your job is to find a and b. Well, it might be a bit more complicated here. You see I've got a cubic denominator and it's factorised and I get the partial fraction expansion a over s, b over s plus 1 and c over s plus 3. So how now do I do inverse Laplace? Once you've done your partial fraction expansion, you simply use the table of Laplace transforms to complete the inverse Laplace. So here you can see I've started with 4 over s squared plus 3s plus 2. I've done my partial fraction expansion to get 4 over s plus 1 minus 4 over s plus 2. And then I've looked in the table and I've said 4 over s plus 1 corresponds to 4e to the minus t, and 4 over s plus 2 corresponds to 4e to the minus 2t. What about this next one? 4s plus 1 over s squared plus 4s. First, I do my partial fraction expansion to get 1 over s plus 3 over s plus 4, and then I recognise that 1 over s 
corresponds to a constant, and 3 over s plus 4 corresponds to 3e to the minus 4t. And here I've done a cubic example, and you can see again I've done my partial fraction expansion into my three terms, and then each of those terms I look up in my table and it corresponds to a time domain signal. What happens, however, if you have complex roots in your denominator? Now, this is going to differ slightly from what you've done in mathematics. Here, you must remember what partial fraction components you need. And in particular, you must look in your table of Laplace transforms. So, for example, if you have a quadratic factor in the denominator, s plus a squared plus omega squared, you know that in your table, you've got a form omega over s plus a squared plus omega squared and a form s plus a over s plus a squared plus omega squared. And so these are the forms that you need to look for when you do your partial fraction expansion. So here's an example. I've got a Laplace transform 2s plus 1 over s plus 2 squared plus c squared. So when I do my partial fraction expansion, I'm going to exploit the forms that I'm looking for. So you can see I've got the 3 there because that corresponds to the omega term and I've put the denominator obviously correct. But So I've got a times 3 because that corresponds to this sort of form here. And then I've got a b times s plus 2 because that corresponds to that form there. And so if I do it this way and I find a and b, then immediately the a term corresponds to an e to the minus 2t a sine 3t and the b term corresponds to e to the minus 2t b cos 3t. So the key difference is when you do your partial fraction expansion, make sure you put it into the forms that are in the table. So a different example. What happens if you have real and complex roots combined? So here you'll notice I've got a real root in the denominator and I've got a factor which has got complex roots. So in my partial fraction expansion, I use the forms in the table. So the real root, I write as a over s plus 3. And the complex roots, I've got to exploit these two forms which I've mentioned already. So I've got b times 1. Why times 1? Because the implied omega is 1. You can see that because I've got a 1 squared here. And then I have a c times s plus 3. OK, so now all I need to do is find the a, b and c. So the a corresponds to a signal a e to the minus 3t. The next term corresponds to a signal e to the minus 3t, capital B, sine t. And the last one to c, e to the minus 3t, cos t. Now I should emphasise, in practice, doing this by hand is quite tedious. So I would recommend in the long term you use software tools. And there's a lot more explanation of how to do that in the extra resources. Some conclusions. This video has given a brief summary of inverse Laplace transforms encountered in the first course. In general terms, students need to be competent with partial fractions. Now, this is the core skill used, and that skill should be covered in your mathematical mo modules and in it some supporting resources that I provide. Now, a core difference is the need to exploit the table of Laplace transforms. So when you do your partial fraction expansion, make sure you do it in terms of the forms that are in your table of Laplace transforms. And a reminder here, we're not covering multiple roots in a first course, though you may do that in mathematics. And of course, as ever, keep up with your quizzes, tutorial sheets and bring any questions to contact sessions.